from MSNBC. Decision 2020. Election night. Live from Democracy Plaza. Here now are Rachel Maddow and Brian Williams. Here we go, 6 p.m. in the East, and we're underway. Americans have been voting for days, setting records, in fact, and they are still voting at this hour in what is a titanic struggle for the future of our country. It will now be decided during an uncontrolled pandemic in our country, which explains the 100 million-plus votes that are already in. Brian Williams here with you from our NBC News Global Headquarters in New York, joined by my colleague and friend Rachel Maddow at the far end of our expanded studios. Rachel. Thank you, Brian. Nicole Wallace and Joy Reid are here by my side at our corner of the studio as well at a physical distance that <laughs> belies our emotional closeness. <laughs> I gotta come up with a different one every night. Uh, our election night MVP, Steve Kornacki, of course, is at the board standing by for the first results, which are already starting to come in tonight. Former Vice President Joe Biden back in his hometown, Wilmington, Delaware, after one final push through Pennsylvania, stopping in Philly and in Scranton, where he visited his childhood home. The former Vice President started his day early this morning by going to church and then by visiting the grave of his late son, Bo. While for his part, President Trump started his day by calling into Fox News, and aside from a brief stop at his campaign headquarters over in Virginia, the president has been largely out of view this day. Tonight, the president is huddled at the White House behind a new non-scalable wall where he is expected to host 250 to 400 people, as one does during a pandemic, at an indoor election night party in the people's house. It is going to be a big night tonight, no matter what happens in the end. We are in for the long haul. We recognize that the long haul might not mean this evening in terms of getting results, but we will be here with you with you for it throughout. Let's get started now. And here we go. Uh, here's what we have for you at 7 p.m. These are all NBC News projections. Georgia, too early to call. Indiana, as expected, we are projecting Donald Trump as the projected winner there. Virginia, too early to call, though Biden is leading. In Kentucky, too early to call at this hour. South Carolina, too early to call at this hour. Vermont, up in New England, too early to call. Here is the long and arduous road to 270 electoral votes. Again, one state awarded as expected it went to the incumbent president. Me, as I will ask every time we hear that sound, which means we have a call and here it is. His first inroad into New England as expected. Joe Biden has been awarded by our projection. The state of Vermont will go to the national map. There we are, the road to 270. One each at this hour coming up on 719 Eastern. NBC News is now projecting a winner in the Kentucky presidential race. President Donald Trump projected to be the winner in Kentucky. That will be eight electoral votes for the president. Sorry about that. When the U.S. Senate goes back in session, Mitch McConnell will either be majority or minority leader. In any event, the voters in the state of Kentucky uh, have awarded him a seventh term in office at age 78 mitch mcconnell has pushed back the challenge from amy mcgrath uh, right now a pretty healthy lead he is our projected winner in the state of kentucky already awarded to donald trump rachel forgive me back to your conversation no very good. it's good to know the uh, that that senate race has been interesting because democrats i think motivated both by enthusiasm for amy mcgrath but a lot by uh, the, a lack of enthusiasm for Mitch McConnell and a desire to try to give him a hard time at home. Democrats poured a ton of money into that race uh, in a way that was never really uh, reflected. There was no parallel in the poll numbers to reflect the amount of money that was spent trying to get Amy McGrath competitive there. Uh, but Mitch McConnell will be back uh, in the Senate leading the Democrat, leading the Republicans, excuse me, in either, as Brian said, the majority or the minority. In the state of Florida, if you've been watching our coverage, you know the state of conversation conversation there. We are saying the race is too close to call, separated by just under 10,000. In the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, big race, 
big electoral vote uh, fight tonight. Too early to call. In the state of New Hampshire, too early to call. In my home state of New Jersey, Joe Biden, the projected winner of 14 electoral votes. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Joe Biden, the projected winner tonight. In the state of Maryland, Joe Biden, the predicted winner tonight. In Oklahoma, Donald Trump holds on to Oklahoma. In Delaware, native son Joe Biden is the projected winner. In D.C., where you can vote without representation in Congress, Joe Biden, the projected winner of the District of Columbia. In Illinois, too early to call is our call. In Tennessee, too early to call, though a lead by Donald Trump. In Missouri, too early to call. In Alabama, too early to call. Nutmeg State of Connecticut, too early to call, though we note a lead on the part of Joe Biden. Mississippi, too early to call. Maine, too early to call. Rhode Island, too early to call, though again we note a lead at this hour on the part of Joe Biden. Ohio of the battlegrounds remains too early. Georgia remains too early for us to call. North Carolina remains too early to call. Here is the long and winding road to 270. The colored in states are the states we have project have a projection and that is a Trump victory as expected in the state of Tennessee with its 11 electoral votes. Uh, that is our NBC 23 Eastern time. We come back from a break with two calls. The state of West Virginia, as expected, has been awarded to Donald Trump with its five electoral votes. And then the land of steady habits, as they call it, the nutmeg state of Connecticut, seven electoral votes in the Joe Biden column. We'll show you where that leads us as the states color in on the road to 270 with awarded electoral votes thus far. Steve, forgive me. Uh, we are awarding the state of Arkansas as expected to Donald Trump. Six electoral votes. That's where the vote is coming down as of this hour. And this is what this state does now to the map. You see red filling in in the center of the country. Arkansas now completes that three state swing. You see the blue coming up in the news is projecting. Let's start with a big one, a big Northeast state with 29 electoral votes. NBC News projecting as expected Joe Biden will win in New York. We move on to Texas. We've been talking about Texas. We have it too early to call. Michigan, hugely critical state tonight, too early to call. Wisconsin, ditto, too early to call. Minnesota, too early to call. To the vital southwest state of Arizona, too early to call. Colorado, too early, though Biden, we note, is in the lead. Louisiana, too early, though Trump, we note, is in the lead. In Kansas, too early to call. Let's go through the Midwest. Nebraska, too early to call. Southwest to New Mexico, too early to call. On up to North Dakota, too early to call. Slightly south to South Dakota, too early, though we note Trump leading in South Dakota as expected. And Wyoming, too early to call. Donald Trump is in the lead in Wyoming. Let's check out the bar graph uh, from the uh, outback view of our building. The road to 270 electoral votes awarded thus far 80 to 48 at this hour. Colorado, Joe Biden, not a flip, forgive me. This is presidential, Colorado, nine electoral votes. Take back what I said about a flip. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, back to you at the board as we look at the uh, first blue state west of the Mississippi. This was the race we were alluding to. I knew we were on the cusp of a uh, call. Uh, that, indeed, is a flip for the Democrats in the Senate, John Hickenlooper over Cory Gardner. Uh, for the Republicans, John Cornyn is returning to the Senate from Texas. In Alabama, 
this widely watched Senate race too early to call. In Arizona, the Mark Kelly, Martha McSally race too early to call. Kansas Senate, additionally, too early to call. Let's go up to the state of Maine. Talk about widely watched, too early to call. Let's go out to Michigan. Too early to call between James and Peters. Arkansas, Tom Cotton's going back to the U.S. Senate. In fact, we have a list of incumbents that are going right back to the U.S. Senate, starting with Chris Coons, Democratic side, Delaware. Ed Mackey up in uh, Massachusetts, turns out his biggest challenge was a Democrat named Kennedy. New Hampshire, Shaheen's going back to the Senate. New Jersey, Cory Booker's going back to the Senate. Oklahoma, Senator Inhofe going back to the Senate. Mike Rounds is going back from South Dakota. And Tennessee Senate seat will remain in Republican hands with Bill Haggerty, the projected winner tonight at this hour. U.S. Senate makeup, this is a lot. 40 Dems, 37 Republicans. Net gain of one for the Democrats. That's the Hickenlooper victory in Colorado. Cory Gardner was about as heavily targeted as any Republican incumbent going in to this cycle. The interruption, another state call, and that is, as expected, Donald Trump, the winner in South Dakota. And while it hasn't come up a lot tonight, there is that stretch of coronavirus that is raging through the Dakotas right now, just part of the backdrop of the vote in 2020 during an uncontrolled pandemic. But that's our projection that when it's all said and done, looks to be about a 70-30 split in South Dakota. Here is another red state on the national map. Uh, here we go again. A matching Dakota has been projected for Donald Trump. Again, as expected, North Dakota to go along with South Dakota. Sharp-eyed viewers saw that we had quietly added uh, that bit of red in the Northern Plains. That's our projection with its three electoral votes. That's how the map. Steve, in terms of what you're looking at right now, we've been talking about Ohio. We've been talking over here a lot about Pennsylvania. We haven't learned, heard a lot from you in terms of what's in in Pennsylvania thus far. Is there anything in Pennsylvania that is worth talking about yet? Yeah, not much, but I just want to give you a sense of how confusing Pennsylvania is going to be. I mean, you see red in Pittsburgh right now. What you're seeing here... This is same day vote basically uh, in Pittsburgh. And that's why Donald Trump, you know, remember, he was going to win the same day vote big. There's a little bit of mail vote that's mixed in there. But this is basically one of those places where the mail is expected to come in. You know, this is Pittsburgh. I mean, this is this is what a, a, a normal sort of <laughs> Democratic margin would look like in Pittsburgh. So, you know, it, you see Trump at 69. You got to remember there is a ton of mail in a place like Pittsburgh. You take a look at Philadelphia, where, again, it looks like what they've actually released here early in Philadelphia. There are some places in Pennsylvania that are going to do this. You know, there are some places they're going to release some mail vote tonight in Pennsylvania. And I believe they've released a little bit of it early here in Pennsylvania. Again, they're expecting north of 800,000 votes here. You got a quick dump of this shortly after the polls close in Philadelphia here. Joe Biden over 90 percent. Again, this is just obviously core Democratic territory here. Um, but I think we are going to see some mail in voting here. Um, this, this, uh, I, I am going to encourage people to, to disregard this and I'm going to look into this because that doesn't make sense. With what 95%, I'm seeing there, percentage, what I'm yeah, seeing there in Lehigh County, I think there might be an error. Sometimes there are numbers moving around in the system and the wrong thing pops up at the wrong time. But basically in, in Pennsylvania tonight, there are going to be some counties, you know, in Philadelphia is an example. Allegheny is an example where they are going to end up reporting out some of their mail in vote. I think by the time we get to midnight, you know, later on in the night, there are other counties, two smaller ones. They will report out some of it. And then over the next couple of days, you'll get the rest of it. Was expected. Donald Trump hangs on to the state of South Carolina. Nine electoral votes. Two more uh, projections here. NBC News has determined that when all is said and done, Democrats will retain control of the House of Representatives, and that's all we're saying. We just got the votes from Maricopa County, Arizona. Oh. And this is a big thing in Arizona. When they report them out, they report a ton of them out. Here we go. We got over 2 million votes wow. in Arizona. Okay. 
Biden leading here is about three quarters of the vote in Maricopa County. Maricopa County is like 60 percent of the population for the entire state of Arizona. It's the Phoenix metro area. It's a giant suburb. Joe Biden leading this 54-45. Now, this was what you're looking at here are the early votes that were cast up until this weekend. These are going to come in Arizona. We're going to come in sort of three buckets of votes over the next few hours and maybe into tomorrow. Alabama Senate. And remember how Doug Jones shook the political world when he won as a Democrat. Doug Jones has lost tonight. This is a flip to the Republicans. Tommy Tuberville, Tuberville is the new senator elect. So Democrats went one up in Colorado. Republicans went one up in Alabama. I was never good at math, but it seems like we're right back to where we started tonight, unless your name is Tuberville or Hickenlooper. We have another call, and this is another New England state, and that is New Hampshire. And it's for electoral votes awarded to Joe Biden. We believe when all the votes are counted, uh, differentiated by about 22,000 votes right now. Let's take a look at the map and see where this leaves us as we look nationally. Again, two different trends of blue, southwest, northeast, red from the Mississippi Valley Trump to the Atlantic the uh, seaboard, all the way up through the uh, middle. A call from the Southwest, and that is that Joe Biden has been awarded New Mexico and its five electoral votes. Uh, since, uh, thanks to Vaughn and his good reporting, we've been talking about the Southwest. Uh, since this puts another blue square on the map west of the Mississippi. Nicole Wallace, where do you put states like... NBC has now projected that in the great state of Missouri, President Donald Trump will once again be the winner in Missouri. Again, that is not a pickup for the Republicans. Missouri has been deep red uh, and in the Republican column for some time now. But uh, that Missouri call is now official in terms of NBC News's projection. We are back. You'll note Missouri snuck in there before the break. Illinois has spoken. Neither of these are pickups. They're holds. This is Joe Biden, the projected winner of Illinois, and it's 20 electoral votes. And Senator Dick Durbin is going to remain in the U.S. Senate as well. Lindsey Graham is headed back to the U.S. Senate from South Carolina. Jamie Harrison, despite a flood of outside money, especially at the end of this thing, could not do it, could not convert it in the state of South Carolina. Georgia, second race, uh, will be indeed a runoff between uh, Warnock and Leffler. Uh, that we have just uh, been able to put in the runoff category. It's a lot to balance, but Rachel, this is what we do. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a lot. It does mean that we are going to have a potentially determinative yeah. Senate runoff in Georgia in January. California awards 55 electoral votes, as is our projection. Not a surprise to Joe Biden. Oregon, seven electoral votes to Joe Biden. Washington, 12 electoral votes to Joe Biden. Idaho, too early to call. We have determined Trump leads. Here's the graphic to 270. It's 192, 114 at this hour. 270 is where you start the conversation. Here's uh, backfilling some of the races we're watching. This is uh, Florida, too close to call, and we have determined this to be too close to call, though Trump leads. North Carolina, too close to call. Texas, too early to call Trump leads. Pennsylvania, too early to call. Ohio, too early to call Trump leads. Michigan, too early to call, period. Georgia, too early to call. Arizona, too early to call Biden leads. Wisconsin, too early to call. Minnesota, too early to call. Iowa, too early 
to call. Nevada, too early to call. What are the odds? Let's look at the map. We've been watching the color-coded states get awarded all night to think that 6 o'clock Eastern time, five hours ago when we started this, it was a blank gray slate. Low, they have filled in. Low, there's a lot of math to go. Can I tell you what I have in my notes? Because all I've been doing is cramming for the last year and getting ready for tonight. My notes on each of these three, three states. Wisconsin. State Elections Commission chief says Wisconsin will probably not report unofficial results until Wednesday at the earliest. Pennsylvania. Governor releases TV ad warning residents that will take, quote, a few days for the yep. vote to be completed. Secretary of State says there is no way Pennsylvania is announcing a winner on election night. Michigan. Secretary of State says the count will likely take until Friday. Yeah. So that's Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, which yes. is what we are looking at. Yeah, we got a big number here. Uh, NBC News is projecting Ohio will go in the Trump column when all the votes are counted. 5345 mm. race right now. That'll change. That'll fluctuate. But that is our projection. 18 electoral votes, a hugely valuable state in the Donald Trump column. That had previously been characterized as too early to call with Trump in the lead. But again, Ohio now projecting Trump as the winner of Ohio. In terms of what remains outstanding in closely watched um, swing states, um, in Florida right now, I should also remind you that uh, that is being characterized as a Donald Trump lead, even though that state has not been called. Uh, Florida has not been called by NBC News, but NBC is describing it as a Trump lead. Uh, in terms of other states that we're watching, obviously we are focusing, like you can't believe, on Pennsylvania and uh, Arizona and, and Michigan and, and Minnesota and Wisconsin. In Texas, NBC is also characterizing that state as a Donald Trump lead at this point, but has not yet called it. One more. Idaho to Donald Trump, your projected winner. Um, that is no change from the 2016 map. Let's go to tonight's map, which you'll recall hours ago started in all gray without a single state filled in. That is about mirroring how these states have fallen tonight. We have so many in the margins yet to be decided. All indications are it will be days before we know. The projected winner in the Commonwealth of Virginia is Joe Biden. So 13 electoral votes in his column. And let's put up where that leaves us on the road to 270, just to remind everybody. And then we'll talk to our friend James. 206 to 136 race right now. And there it may remain rather paralyzed. Heidi Prisbola uh, is in Michigan, is in Detroit, uh, specifically with a look at what we can expect in terms of the Michigan vote. Heidi, it's great to have you with us tonight. What are you hearing in Michigan? Yeah, Rachel, I think that was Joy who said, just breathe. And I can tell you, after being on the phone with Michigan officials all night, they really endorsed that sentiment. They're looking <laughs> at these numbers that are coming in, and they say, this is truly an overrepresentation of the in-person vote here in Michigan. They couldn't even start tabulating a lot of these early absentee votes until this morning. And because of the crazy patchwork here of reporting, some of the precincts aren't even sending in their AV, their absentee votes yet. So you're getting a very skewed representation. Let me give you an example. Macomb County, Trump won there by 10 points in 2016. We're starting to get the early numbers. He's got a wide lead again. But you peel that up a little bit and you see that there are already some precincts where we do have a fuller account of the vote and we've seen our first red to blue shift in center line where Joe Biden is outperforming what Hillary Clinton did. Sorry to interrupt. NBC News is projecting Donald Trump will be the ultimate winner in Florida and it's 29 electoral votes. Running right now 51-2 to 47-8, separated by just shy of 400,000 votes in what has just become such a hugely valuable, influential, and for the Democrats, vexing state. 
uh, as uh, Claire McCaskill and others have pointed out tonight to uh, soothe the uh, anxieties of uh, her fellow Democrats. This was never a projected uh, Biden state. It was on the wish list. It was hoped for. You don't send Barack Obama into a state you don't want. Uh, but the candidate himself did not make it a personal priority, uh, uh, preferring instead to concentrate on that uh, blue wall we've been discussing, the very same blue wall that may take days to determine this election result. But Florida, uh, where our projection is concerned, is done and dusted for this cycle. Your patience is commendable. We knew this was going to go long, but who knew we we're going to go into maybe tomorrow morning, maybe even longer. But look, we feel good about where we are. We really do. I'm here to tell you tonight, we believe we're on track to win this election. We knew because of the unprecedented early vote and the mail-in vote that it's going to take a while. We're going to have to be patient until we, uh, the hard work of tallying the votes is finished. And it ain't over till every vote is counted, every ballot is counted. But we're feeling good. We're feeling good about where we are. We believe one of the nets has suggested we've already won Arizona, but we're confident about Arizona. That's a turnaround. We also just called it for Minnesota, and we're still in the game in Georgia, although that's not one we expected. And we're feeling real good about Wisconsin and Michigan. And by the way, it's going to take time to count the votes. We're going to win Pennsylvania. Yes. I'm going to talk to the folks in Philly, Allegheny County, Scranton, and they're really encouraged by the turnout and what they see. Look, you know, we could know the results as early as tomorrow morning, but it may take a little longer. As I've said all along, it's not my place or Donald Trump's place to declare who's won this election. That's the decision of the American people. But I'm optimistic about this outcome. And I want to thank every one of you who came out and voted in this election. And by the way, Chris Coons and the Democrats, congratulations here in Delaware. John Carney. John Carney. Hey, John, the Gov, yeah, I, I, the whole team, man. You've done a great job. I'm grateful to the poll workers, to our volunteers, our canvassers. Everyone who participated in this democratic process. And I'm grateful to all of my supporters here in Delaware and all across the nation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And folks, you heard me say it before. Every time I walk out of my grandpa's house up in Scranton, he'd yell, Joey, keep the faith. And my grandma, when she was alive, yelled, no, Joey, spread it. Keep the faith, guys. We're going to win this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Your patience is great. <laughs> Let's walk over here. State call one of the states you just ran through, and that is Texas. Uh, it turns out that uh, Democrats, maybe some of them, spotted a blue mirage in some of the early numbers, and uh, hope overcame uh, facts in this case. Texas remains. A red state under Donald Trump uh, and 52, 46 and change is where we have the percentages right now. But here is how it affects the road to 270, because that is a chunk of electoral votes. That's a big hunk of red that now makes a south to north path up through the Dakotas for President Trump. No change here again. Uh, but uh, still a big piece of political real estate. A big piece of real estate on the map. No flip, no change. 
As expected, Donald Trump has won the state of Montana with its three electoral votes, uh, just under 52, uh, 44 for uh, Joe Biden in Maine. Too early to call, but Biden is leading. Remember, uh, there are there are all kinds of vagaries about the way uh, Mainers uh, vote in these elections. Uh, the congressional district divide, the ranked voting. Uh, you see Montana, we just flashed from stripes to solid red. Uh, again, you can see the geographic path, Robert Gibbs, that the president is carving, but again, no changes here. It's a small one. It's a mighty one. And that's Rhode Island with its four electoral votes. Joe Biden has been projected the winner of Rhode Island. And just as regionalisms have changed and come and gone and developed over the past few election cycles, um, the Northeast, New England, has become, as you can see reflected on the map, dependable, uh, safe blue ground uh, as, uh, as for right now. Maine, of course, as we mentioned, remains a question mark. New York, no question about it. Pennsylvania is the next big patch of gray. First of all, we are projecting the state of Iowa will go to Donald Trump when all the votes are in and counted. And more than that, uh, Joni Ernst, it appears, is heading back to the U.S. Senate. She was under real and concentrated threat for her seat, had a bad uh, debate appearance uh, days before the calendar day of Election Day, and uh, Joni Ernst, uh, U.S. military veteran, is going back into the U.S. Senate. We have a call on Nebraska 2. Steve Kornacki, that district with its one electoral vote where we're reminded Donald Trump flew in and did a rally looking for that electoral vote. That was the famous evening uh, people had a three mile walk in the cold that has been awarded to Joe Biden, correct? Yeah, and there it is. We were just going through. We can call it back up on the screen right here. This is Omaha. Omaha metro area. And again, this is these are the same numbers we were just looking at. There's one update, I think, to come here, but there weren't too many votes left. This is actually, this is a district Democrats felt very confident in because we've talked about the growing Democratic strength in suburbs, metropolitan areas. Donald Trump had carried this by just three points in 2016. Democrats were very confident they could get it this time. Barack Obama, by the way, back in 2008 when he beat John McCain, also carried this district. It had been Republican since then. It goes back to the Democrats, goes to Biden tonight. Democrats get their first electoral vote out of Nebraska in a dozen years. I mean, how about that, though? Just think about it for a second. We're at, I got to check the time here, we're at 1.30 on the East Coast. And for all of our talk before this election about, is this state going to flip? Is that state going to, the first thing to flip didn't happen until 1.30 tonight. And it's a single congressional district in Nebraska. Otherwise, this map is holding to form from what we saw four years ago. The state of Minnesota has been projected to go in the Biden column. Uh, it's uh, late at night, but it uh, happened. Uh, it got a little wobblier earlier in the evening than a lot of Democrats would have preferred, but as Claire McCaskill um, pointed out in her prediction that it would go blue, it went blue. Uh, that's the margin that we're working on right now, 53 and a half to 46 and change, and here is where your road to 270 is to 2213, but it's early yet. Sorry, Nicole. And the question then becomes if Biden ultimately emerges, um, you know, narrowly, even if narrowly as the winner, he then faces a country that is substantially Trumpist. Right. That has, a, you know, a, a bare majority of people who reject that everything that that comes with, including, you know, caging children and stealing them from their parents and the, you know, sexual harassment, et cetera, and all of that. But then a substantial minority um, that is OK with it or embraces it. And so, you know, I just wonder what all of this says about us. I think as the rest of the world watches this happen all night tonight. 
I think it raises real questions about what America is at the end of the day and whether what Trump is is more like what the American character is than people ever, ever wanted to admit. I want to thank the American people for their tremendous support. Millions and millions of people voted for us tonight. And uh, a very sad group of people is trying to disenfranchise that group of people. And we won't stand for it. We will not stand for it. I want to thank the First Lady, my entire family, and Vice President Pence, Mrs. Pence, for being with us all through this. And we were getting ready for a big celebration. We, we were winning everything, and all of a sudden it was just called off. The results tonight have been phenomenal, and we are getting ready. I mean, literally, we were just all set to get outside and just celebrate something that was so beautiful, so good, uh, such a vote, such a success. The citizens of this country have come out in record numbers. This is a record. There's never been anything like it to support our incredible movement. We won states that we weren't expected to win. Florida, we didn't win it. We won it by a lot. And We won the great state of Ohio. We won Texas. We won Texas. We won Texas by 700,000 votes, and they don't even include it in the tabulations. It's also clear that we have won Georgia. We, we're up by... 2.5% to 117,000 votes with only 7% left. They're never going to catch us. They can't catch us. Yeah. Likewise, we've clearly won North Carolina, <laughs> where we're up 1.4% or 77,000 votes with only approximately 5% left. They can't catch us. We also, uh, if you look and you see, uh, Arizona, we have yeah. a lot of life in that. And somebody said, somebody declared that it was a victory for, and maybe it will be. I mean, that's possible. But certainly there were a lot of votes out there that we could get because we're now just coming into what they call Trump territory. I don't know what you call it, but these were friendly Trump voters. And that could be overturned. The gentleman that called it, I watched tonight. He said, well, we think it's fairly unlikely that he could catch. Well, fairly unlikely. <laughs> and we don't even need it. We don't need that. That was just a state that if we would have gotten it, it would have been nice, Arizona. But there's a possibility, maybe even a good possibility. In fact, since I saw that originally, it's been changed, and the numbers have substantially come down just in a small amount of votes. So we want that, obviously, to stay in play. But most importantly, we're winning Pennsylvania by a tremendous amount of votes. We're, We're up 600. Think of this. Think of this. Think of this. We're up 690,000 votes in Pennsylvania. 690,000. These aren't even close. It's not like, oh, it's close. With 64% of the vote in, it's going to be almost impossible to catch. And we're coming into good Pennsylvania areas where they happen to like your president. I mean, it's like, uh, so we'll probably expand that. Uh, we're winning Michigan, but I'll tell you, I looked at the numbers. I said, whoa. I looked, I said, wow, that's a lot. By almost 300,000 votes. And 65% of the vote is in. And we're winning Wisconsin, and I said, we're winning. We don't need all of them. We need, because when you add Texas in, which wasn't added, I spoke with the 
really wonderful governor of Texas just a little while ago, and Greg Abbott, he said, uh, congratulations. He called me to congratulate me on winning Texas. I mean, we won Texas. I don't think they finished quite the tabulation, but there's no way. And uh, it was almost complete, but he congratulated me. Then he said, by the way, what's going on? I've never seen anything like this. Can I tell you what? Nobody has. So we won by 107,000 votes with 81% of the vote. That's Michigan. So when you take those three states in particular, and you take all of the others, I mean, we have, we have so many. We had such a big night. You just take a look at all of these states that we've won tonight. And then you take a look at the kind of margins that we've won them by. And, and all of a sudden, it's not like we're up 12 votes and we have 60 percent left. We won states, and all of a sudden, I said, what happened to the election? It's off. And we have all these announcers saying, what happened? And then they said, oh, because you know what happened? They knew they couldn't win. So they said, let's go to court. And did I predict this, Newt? Did I say this? I've been saying this from the day I heard they were going to send out tens of millions of ballots. I said exactly because either they were going to win or if they didn't win, they'll take us to court. So Florida was a tremendous victory. 377,000. Texas, as we said. Ohio. Think of this. Ohio, a tremendous state, a big state. I love Ohio. We won by 8.1%, 461. Think of it. Almost 500,000 votes. North Carolina, big victory with North Carolina. And so we won there. We lead by 76,000 votes with almost nothing left. And all of a sudden, everything just stopped. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. So our goal now is to ensure the integrity for the good of this nation. This is a very big moment. This is a major fraud in our nation. We want the law to be used in a proper manner. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at 4 o'clock in the morning and add them to the list, okay? It's, it's a very sad, it's a very sad moment. To me, this is a very sad moment. And we will win this. And we, as far as I'm concerned, we already have won it. So I just want to thank you. We are um, reluctant to step in, but duty bound to point out when he says we did win this election, we've already won. Uh, that is not based in the facts at all. Uh, again, uh, there are millions of votes yet to be counted. Our presidents don't select our victors. All right, welcome back. We have a projection, uh, actually a call to make at 4.38 a.m. The state of Hawaii and its four electoral votes going to Joe Biden. He is the projected winner in that state. We just saw Steve talk about why that is important. Once again, Hawaii now being called for Joe Biden, winning there quite substantially, 65 percent to uh, Joe Biden. That brings his total up to 224 electoral votes to President Trump's 213. And more ballots have been counted. NBC News now projects that Maine goes to Biden. Three of Maine's electoral votes. That is a split. There are four electoral votes. There's one congressional district that goes to Donald Trump. MSNBC's Ali Velshi is at the big board with a look at where things stand now. Ali, give us the very latest. Maine is the latest. Gonna, Ali, I'm going to interrupt well. you right now because we have a call that we can make. And let me just confirm with Control Room. Are we ready to make this call? So NBC News can now say that Joe Biden is the apparent winner in Wisconsin. The apparent winner in Wisconsin. That would award him, if it does officially go to him, those 10 electoral votes. 99% of the vote in. Joe Biden, 49.4%. 
Donald Trump, 48.8%, a difference of 20,510 votes. Uh, there's still a little bit left to come in. The Donald Trump team has already said that they are going to demand a recount in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin will allow them to do that because they will be within 1%, the 1% margin in Wisconsin. That can't start, though, for at least another week. But again, for everybody, NBC News is now calling Joe Biden the apparent winner in Wisconsin and potentially the person who's going to take away those 10 electoral votes. This is a major win for the Biden team, Ali Vitale, and, and, and one that they, as you have been saying, have been banking on since early this morning. NBC News is projecting Joe Biden the winner of the key battleground state of Michigan. All of its 16 electoral votes go to Joe Biden. Um, as we said, he is the one with the clearest path to 270. Let's see where that puts him. Um, look at here another razor thin margin for Joe Biden over Donald Trump. As this vote was coming in, the outstanding vote was very clearly, according to our own Steve Kornacki, in parts of that state that were favorable to Joe Biden. Another blow to Donald Trump's um, delusion, I guess, at this point last night that he was the winner. And it may move us toward what Donald Trump and his campaign is talking about, which is a legal avenue. Once again, Joe Biden, um, NBC News is now projecting Joe Biden to be the winner of the state of Michigan. Tim. Big question for you. What congressional races are your sources talking about this morning? Uh, a massively bad night for House Democrats across the board. Yeah. They were supposed to, and we talked about it, Eamon. They were supposed to gain 15 seats, 12 to 15 seats. Their metrics, not mine, they didn't. Uh, their margins are going to get narrower. Kevin McCarthy had a big night in the House. And no matter who takes the White House, Eamon, Capitol Hill is again going to be a battleground for the next two years. So just it was something that we could all look forward to talking about over the next two years. Well, let's bring into the conversation now somebody whose ears are undoubtedly burning as we keep talking about the Biden campaign. <laughs> Biden campaign senior advisor Ron Klain uh, is here with us now. Ron, thank you so much for, for making time. Um, first of all, we're sorry to talk about you behind your back, but <laughs> our perception here uh, at, among us at MSNBC is that you guys haven't raised unnecessary expectations or unreasonable expectations, and things, as fraught as they may feel, are sort of going to plan in terms of how you are going to get to 270. Yeah, Rachel, I mean, I, I, I appreciate what Nicole said as a very experienced campaign operative herself. Uh, we had a plan to win this race. It was a battle for the soul of America. There was no one in the Biden campaign who thought this would be easy. As Vice President Biden said today, only three times in a century has an incumbent president been defeated. It's super hard to do. And so we knew this was going to be a very, very difficult race. We focused on those three core Midwestern states, uh, trying to also pick up Arizona, which it looks like we have done, uh, holding on to uh, the states that the Democrats won in 2016, and playing hard in some other states. I think we're going to be very close. Maybe we'll even win Georgia. So we've executed the campaign plan we had. And I think that when all the votes are counted, Joe Biden will, in fact, be the next president of the United States. So have an update right now in terms of the United States Senate. Is that correct? Yes. NBC News can now project that in the United States Senate race in the great state of Michigan, Democratic incumbent Gary Peters has held on and will be returning to the Senate. This is an important, important part in terms of the, uh, the, the Democrats and Republicans calculation in terms of the ba balance of power in the Senate. It's also been a real drama for Peters himself. Uh, that was a tight, tight race. It has taken sort of second place in the national media's attention to the presidential fight in Michigan. But that Senate race was very, very hard fought. Gary Peters will be returning to the U.S. Senate. Um, again, that's just new. NBC News just projecting that at this hour. We're going to go now to Gotti Schwartz. Um, Gotti Schwartz is in Arizona, and specifically, you should know this, he is outside the county elections department for Maricopa County, which is downtown Phoenix. Now, we have been reporting tonight on new ballots coming in from Maricopa County that are um, giving us a lot of new insight into the potential matchup here between President Trump and Vice President Biden. But as you can see, Gotti's in the middle of quite a crowd there. Gotti, what's going on? 
Yeah, and, and Rachel, it's going to be kind of hard to see just because we're not turning on our lights. Uh, we don't want to be a distraction out here, and there are a lot of people uh, that are very, they have their emotions running extremely high. So anytime these lights come on, uh, you see people running towards uh, the cameras, and then they start screaming, and they've got a bullhorn. So uh, here's what's going on. It's very important that we show you what's happening outside of the Maricopa Election Center right now. Uh, you see that behind me. Uh, that's where they're counting those 400. 100,000 ballots that are still outstanding that could really uh, change the, the course of the the entire uh, election in 2020. They've got some uh, s uh, some sheriff's officers up uh, that are blocking the entrance of the, the election uh, center. We're going to walk this way here. And one of the things that we've seen is uh, right now they're they're kneeling in prayer. But one of the things that we've seen is uh, them chanting very loudly, count that vote, count that vote. Uh, and then we've got poll workers that are coming off of shift, and the poll workers have to be escorted out by uh, armed sheriff's deputies down those stairs and into vans and taken away from here. Uh, so this is the type uh, the type of scene that we're. And we're going to get a little bit closer here. We don't want to get too close. Uh, a lot of people uh, in the crowd are, are, are not wearing masks. We're, we're keeping a, a respectful distance, um, but a loud and very boisterous crowd. You'll start here and then uh, start up here. And they're actually chanting. Fox News sucks. Fox News sucks. The reason why they're chanting that is because Fox News called Arizona uh, for Biden yesterday, and a lot of people are angry about that. We have not called uh, Arizona. Uh, a lot of other organizations have made that decision not to call Arizona. It is much too close right now, but this is a scene outside of the Maricopa Election Center, and we're going to keep an eye on, on what's going on here. Rachel? Georgia is getting a lot of attention, deservedly so, tonight. They are still too close to call, but right there, that is Priscilla Thompson in Atlanta, where the counting goes on. Priscilla, how many votes do they estimate are still out there? 21,000, Brian, that is the magic number here today. And folks are working to get those ballots counted. Uh, I want to step aside and just give you a look at the operation they have going here. For the past 14 hours, people have been in and out of this room working to count those ballots. They started the day with 74,000 ballots and have made pretty significant gains here, but they still have a long way to go. Right now, they're averaging about two to 3,000 ballots per hour hour. Uh, but to be in this room, you feel a sense of energy, a sense of urgency. We spoke to one man here who has actually been here counting ballots today, and he says that you get into a rhythm, and before you know it, the hours have passed, and uh, you know, the time just passes so quickly. And so that is what it's like to be in this room right now as folks are working uh, to get that done. Joining us now, Chair in Constitutional Law at The Ohio State University, Ned Foley. He's an NBC News election law analyst. Ned, good to have you with us this morning. Um, let's start in Pennsylvania, where a lot of eyes are today. We're expecting to get a bunch more vote out of that state today. It could be enough to give the state to Joe Biden, which would put him over the 270 uh, electoral vote threshold. What do you see in some of these lawsuits? Do you see merit in what the president is accusing uh, the elections board there of doing? Uh, good morning. Um, I don't think that any of the lawsuits that we've seen so far are ultimately going to make a difference in the outcome. I think when you're behind in this kind of vote counting litigation, you have to sue and sue quickly because the clock is moving and you need to do something if you're behind. But uh, they often lack merit uh, and the courts are going to reject them if they don't have merit. So, uh, you know, Pennsylvania. Uh, has some issues, but even there, I don't think in the end, the, the litigation will matter. Right now in Nevada, Joe Biden holding on to a slim lead there. Jacob Sobroff has made his way to Las Vegas. He is following the vote count there in Clark County. What are you hearing from officials, Jacob? We'll make sure that uh, we will continue the pressure. Now, actually, you're looking at behind me. That's Matt Schlapp. That's Rick Grinnell. Come with me, the former DNI. Come with me. Come with me. This is the Trump campaign press conference. Oops, sorry, kids. Come this way. 
Hey, Rick Grinnell, uh, we're live on MSNBC right now. Can you talk about the evidence? You are claiming Locking thousands sucks. of illegitimate votes here in Nevada. Locking What's the evidence? You should go in and ask the question of the clerk. No, 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 no. Which you haven't you done You guys yet, just made so the claim. No, in fact, you also said there's no election observers. There's Democratic and Republican election observers inside, Mr. Grinnell. Former DNI Grinnell, acting please, DNI, please where's the evidence of the fraud? You haven't presented any evidence of fraud. Where's the evidence? They've presented no evidence of fraud, Craig. Uh, so we're live on MSNBC. You've said thousands of illegitimate ballots. Thousands of illegitimate ballots. Where are they? Where's the Matt Schlapp? Where are the illegitimate ballots? Where are the illegitimate ballots? Fox News sucks. So thousands of illegitimate ballots is what they're alleging. They've presented literally no evidence of that, and they're saying go to the uh, county here to ask them of that. We know for a fact there are Democratic and Republican election observers inside. Careful behind you there. Um, and the reality is, Craig, uh, what they have said here is supported by virtually no facts. From what we have seen on the ground here, inside this facility, there is observation happening. I spoke to an election observer this morning, and they have now said they are filing in federal court a lawsuit to stop counting of ballots. They didn't say all ballots. They said stop the counting of improper ballots. So at the end of the day, we're going to need to see, uh, as a matter of fact, what the language in that lawsuit says. They had the former attorney general of this state, Laxalt, out here as well. Um, and, uh, and you just saw former acting DNI Grinnell, Matt Schlapp, uh, very familiar names uh, out here in Nevada and across the country. Um, but again, presented without evidence, uh, allegations of fraud here on the ground in Nevada. As the count continues inside, and the vote margin is 8,000 votes at this point, and we expect a new dump of votes in just a little bit. Let me just interrupt you. Let's watch Joe Biden together. We'll pick this up on the other side. The facing this nation. And we're reminded again of the severity of this pandemic. Cases are on the rise nationwide, and we're nearing 240,000 deaths due to COVID. And our hearts go out to each and every family that has lost a loved one to this terrible disease. In America, the vote is sacred. It's how people of this nation express their will. And it is the will of the voters, no one, not anything else, that chooses the president of the United States of America. So each ballot must be counted. And that's what we're going to see going through now. And that's how it should be. Democracy is sometimes messy. It sometimes requires a little patience as well. But that patience has been rewarded now for more than 240 years with a system of govern governance that's been the envy of the world. And we continue to feel, Senator and I, we continue to feel very good about where things stand. We have no doubt that when the count is finished, Senator Harris and I will be declared the winners. So I ask everyone to stay calm, all the people to stay calm. The process is working. The count is being completed and uh, we'll know very soon. So thank you all for your patience, but we have to count the votes. God bless you all and may God protect our troops. Thank you so much. We're gonna go right to the president. Good evening, I'd like to provide the American people with an update on efforts to protect the integrity of our very important 2020 election. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. If you count the votes that came in late, we're looking at them very strongly. But a lot of votes came in late. I've already decisively won many critical states, including massive victories in Florida, Iowa, Indiana, Ohio. Okay, here we are again in the unusual position of not only interrupting the president of the United States, but correcting the president of the United States. And Ari Melber, don't go far, uh, given that you are our chief legal correspondent. There are no illegal votes that we know of. There has been no Trump victory that we know of. That's right. Uh, Brian, we just heard the president come out pretty remarkable, as you said. He said, quote, according to the legal votes, he believes he wins. That's false. Uh, the legal votes, if you want to use that term, or the votes that have been lawfully apportioned, meaning what we've been following in each of these states, uh, do not show that. They actually show what we've found, which is some states going in both directions. 
no one to 270. The same is happening in the state of Georgia. So take us to Georgia. The spread now is 917. That has flipped to Joe Biden for the moment. How does it look going forward? And we actually got just another update that's pushed Biden's lead over 1,000 now statewide. 1,096 mm -hmm. is the new Biden lead. Now, again, like Pennsylvania, overnight there was one place in Georgia that has continued to count. It is Clayton County. Uh, and here you go. You can see it overwhelmingly Democratic Clayton County. This is in the Atlanta metro area. Biden winning the lion's share of the vote here. Uh, they've had several thousand of these absentee ballots, mail ballots that they have been working through overnight. They've provided, I think, seven or eight different updates. Now, there was a big one uh, about an hour and a half ago, I would say, when Biden took the lead statewide in Georgia because of that update. I know I was on the air at that point saying I thought maybe that was the end of it for Clayton County. But as you can see, there are still more votes to come, some more from Clayton County. And a few more were just reported. And again, what that has done is it's put Biden up to a 1,096 vote lead statewide. Now, Clayton was the only one that was counting overnight, but there are some counties left in Georgia that also have remaining uncounted ballots. They will be getting to those this morning and reporting them out. For instance, Gwinnett County right here. Again, Atlanta metro area. This is a strong Biden County. They got a bunch of ballots. You know, bunch is a relative term here. We're inside, I think, at 10,000 mm -hmm. ballots left in the state. But they've got more coming there. A few other places. We've seen a similar trend, though, in Georgia. It's not as dramatic as the one we just described in Pennsylvania, where Biden is just pouring it on in the mail vote everywhere. But we've even seen some Republican counties here, some pro-Trump counties, where the mail vote has been kind of a mixed bag. That seems to be the best Trump is doing with it in these. So again, I think you're seeing a similar, if less dramatic, trend with the mail-in votes coming in in Georgia. Biden continues to benefit, continues to, for a while, cut into Trump's lead now seems to be building his own lead. Steve Kornacki has the results from Pennsylvania. Steve, refreshing, recording right now. What do you have? Okay, Willie, and these are coming directly from the city of Philadelphia's website. They are not quite in our system yet, so I am going to tell you what we have here. Uh, the new total, let me call up Philadelphia, and this is the latest report. You see, these are the numbers that are in our system. The new numbers, mm -hmm. the new current tally is Joe Biden, 553,953 votes, okay? Yep. Donald Trump, 125,513 votes. Okay. So that is a difference of 28,440, okay? Uh, oh, hang on. So I'm, I'm doing... That's the first step. I'm, let me calm down yep. here because we got yep. one important step. What we need to do here is... Subtract. Oh, it's been updated. It's in our system. So, <laughs> All right, we gained about 21,000 votes. And what that did is it has put Joe Biden into the lead. Joe Biden now leads in Pennsylvania statewide by 5,587 votes. So you see in that last update that we just got in a few minutes ago there, Joe Biden picked up about 23, 24,000 votes. I get the exact number here in a second. But again, how did he get that? These are absentee ballots, mail ballots. They have been counting these for a couple days now in Philadelphia. This was an update. Uh, the, it, there's about 27, 28,000 votes that they just reported out. Biden is winning the overwhelming share of them, as he has been in Philadelphia, as he has been around Pennsylvania. And so this has now been enough to vault him past Donald Trump and into the lead statewide. We've got to call a race here. We're going to, we're going to go back out west here, and we can, uh, we can call this race the projected winner in Arizona, that, that special Senate race, Mark Kelly. Mark Kelly, the projected winner in Arizona. It was uh, a closer race than some, some expected. Uh, Martha McSally had been appointed to that seat, uh, but Mark Kelly picking up a seat for Democrats in the upper chamber there. Uh, Mark Kelly, of course, the former astronaut, also uh, the husband of former Congresswoman uh, Gabby Giffords, who was nearly assassinated at a campaign event several years ago. Uh, Mark Kelly going to the Senate. This is how the upper chamber looks at this hour. 48 to 48. And oh, by the way, there's a very good chance that those two races in Georgia there's a chance that both of those could be headed 
to a runoff in early January. Let's go back out west for a moment. Vaughn Hilliard still in Phoenix. He's in Maricopa County. Uh, Vaughn, Mark Kelly going to the Senate. Um, what are you hearing on the ground? Is this what was expected there? Arizona, the state that appears could help defy essentially what the Republican Party under Donald Trump has become. When you look at Arizona, not only is Mark Kelly going to be representing the state as a Democratic senator, he is going to be the second U.S. senator out of Arizona that is a Democrat. And we wanted to read you something from our own director of elections, and that's a gentleman named John Lipinski. John teaches at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, the Ashley Parker uh, um, alma mater. And he has put this out tonight, and, and I don't blame him because there's so much attention on the various network decision desks. The NBC News decision desks, John Lipinski notes, this particular year, there are just so many curveballs that have been thrown our way that we really are taking a little bit more time to make sure that we understand exactly what we're seeing and analyzing it. Biden is president-elect of the United States. Uh, Biden uh, is being called uh, with the, the, the Pennsylvania uh, votes that have just come in. Uh, Biden has been elected, Mika, and uh, uh, tell us about it. Well, uh, the president-elect of the United States, Joe Biden, has run for president three times, and the third time has turned out to be the charm, not only the charm, but possibly the most consequential election of our lifetimes. He is 77 years old. He was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, but calls Wilmington, Delaware his home. At the age of 29, Joe Biden became one of the youngest people ever elected to the U.S. Senate, and that is where he stayed for decades. Uh, even, quite frankly, through tremendous tragedy that has struck his life. Rachel, take a look forward on the, I think it's 73 days or so, between now and January 20th at 12 noon, uh, when Joe Biden will take the oath of office. You know, I wanted to ask your take on that a little bit, Lawrence, because one of the things that I'm finding it hard to get my head around um, is the, I, there's, there's a large distance between all the discussion in advance of the election about what would inevitably happen if Joe Biden won and, you know, John, Donald Trump would inevitably say, oh, no, he didn't. I won and it was stolen from me and everybody should, you know, riot or whatever it is he's going to say. There's all that discussion in advance. And we're now seeing the president, you know, saying that Biden hasn't won and he secretly won by a lot by some magic means that we can't understand. But there's a great distance for me between what I expected to be the impact of those words from the president and what they feel like today. I think I thought it would be scary, or at least it would feel like it was sort of shaking the foundations of the Republic a little bit for the incumbent president, who still is the commander in chief of the military, who still commands the executive branch of the United States government, for him to defy an election result and say, no, 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 I'm still president. I thought that would be big and ominous. And now Trump's, in fact, doing it um, with Biden as president-elect, and it just feels laughable. It just feels small and pitiful and irrelevant. And, I mean, he's at his golf course. Of course he is. NBC News is now projecting Joe Biden as the winner of Nevada. Six electoral votes in Nevada. The electoral vote victory by Joe Biden continues to increase at this hour. NBC News projecting Joe Biden, the winner of Nevada's six electoral votes. That brings, uh, Joe, that brings Joe Biden's total in the Electoral College now to 279. The, uh, Donald Trump still holding at 214. Uh, Ron Allen, we're going back to you now in Washington Square Park. So, the, thanks, Lawrence. The news was that he now has won Nevada as well. We love it. We, I'm so more, excited. Anything more to legitimize this win, we love. We'll take it. We'll take it. This is a great day for everyone, great day for America, and we're in the right, tra we're in the right track somewhere else.
victory, 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 victory. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. So, thank you. Good evening. So, Congressman John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, before his passing, wrote, democracy is not a state, it is an act. And what he meant was that America's democracy is not guaranteed. It is only as strong as our willingness to fight for it. <laughs> to guard it and never take it for granted. And protecting our democracy takes struggle, it takes sacrifice, but there is joy in it, and there is progress, because we, the people, have the power to build a better future. And when our very democracy was on the ballot in this election, with the very soul of America at stake and the world watching, you ushered in a new day for America. <laughs> to our campaign staff and volunteers, this extraordinary team, thank you for bringing more people than ever before into the democratic process. And for making this victory possible, to the poll workers and election officials across our country who have worked tirelessly to make sure every vote is counted, our nation owes you a debt of gratitude. You have protected the integrity of our democracy. And to the American people who make up our beautiful country, thank you for turning out in record numbers to make your voices heard. And I know times have been challenging, especially the last several months. The grief, sorrow, and pain the worries and the struggles. But we have also witnessed your courage, your resilience, and the generosity of your spirit. For four years, you marched and organized for equality and justice for our lives and for our planet. And then you voted.
And you delivered a clear message. You chose hope and unity, decency, science, and yes, truth. You chose Joe Biden as the next president of the United States of America. And Joe is a healer, a uniter, a tested and steady hand, a person whose own experience of loss gives him a sense of purpose that will help us as a nation reclaim our own sense of purpose, and a man with a big heart who loves with abandon. It's his love for Jill, who will be an incredible First Lady. It's his love for Hunter and Ashley and his grandchildren and the entire Biden family. And while I first knew Joe as Vice President, I really got to know him as the father who loved Bo, my dear friend who we remember here today. And to my husband, Doug, <laughs> and our children, Cole and Ella, and my sister, Maya, and our whole family, I love you all more than I can ever express. We are so grateful to Joe and Jill for welcoming our family into theirs on this incredible journey. And to the woman most responsible for my presence here today, my mother, Shamala Gopalan Harris, who is always in our hearts. Uh, when she came here from India at the age of 19, she maybe um, didn't quite imagine this moment, but she believed so deeply and in an America where a moment like this is possible. And so I am thinking about her and about the generations of women, black women, Asian, white, Latina, Native American women, who throughout our nation's history have paved the way for this moment tonight. Women who fought and sacrificed so much for equality and liberty and justice for all, including the black women who are often too often overlooked, but so often prove they are the backbone of our democracy. All the women who have worked to secure and protect the right to vote for over a century, 100 years ago with the 19th Amendment, 55 years ago with the Voting Rights Act, and now in 2020 with a new generation of women in our country who cast their ballots and continued the fight for their fundamental right to vote and be heard. Tonight, I reflect on their struggle, their determination, and the strength of their vision to see what can be unburdened by what has been. And I stand on their shoulders. And what a testament it is to Joe's character that he had the audacity to break one of the most substantial barriers that exists in our country and select a woman as his vice president. But while I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. Because every little girl watching tonight sees that this is a country of possibilities. And to the children of our country, regardless of your gender, 
Our country has sent you a clear message. Dream with ambition. Lead with conviction. And see yourselves in a way that others may not, simply because they've never seen it before. But know that we will applaud you every step of the way. And to the American people, no matter who you voted for, I will strive to be a vice president like Joe was to President Obama, loyal, honest, and prepared, waking up every day thinking of you and your family. Because now is when the real work begins, the hard work, the necessary work, the good work, the essential work to save lives and beat this epidemic, to rebuild our economy so it works for working people, to root out systemic racism in our justice system and society, to combat the climate crisis, to unite our country and heal the soul of our nation. And the road ahead will not be easy, but America is ready, and so are Joe and I. We have elected a president who represents the best in us, a leader the world will respect and our children will look up to, a commander-in-chief who will respect our troops and keep our country safe and a president for all Americans. And it is now my great honor to introduce the president-elect of the United States of America, Joe Biden. And the people who brought me the dance, Delawareans. I see my buddy, Tom, Senator Tom Carper down there, and I think, I think Senator Coons is there, and I think the governor's around. And, is that Ruth Ann? And that former Governor Ruth Ann Minner. Most importantly, my sisters-in-law and my sister Valerie. Anyway. <laughs> Folks, the people of this nation have spoken. They've delivered us a clear victory, a convincing victory, a victory for we, the people. We've won with the most votes ever cast on presidential ticket in the history of the nation. 74 million. Well, I must admit, it surprised me. Tonight, we're seeing all over this nation, all cities and all parts of the country, indeed across the world, an outpouring of joy, of hope, renewed faith, and tomorrow, bring a better day. And I'm humbled by the trust and confidence you placed in me. I pledge to be a president who seeks not to divide, but unify, who, who doesn't see red states and blue states, only sees the United States. And work with all my heart, with the confidence of the whole people, to win the confidence of all of you. And for that is what America, I believe, is about. It's about people, and that's what our administration will be all about. I sought this office.
to restore the soul of America, to rebuild the backbone of this nation, the middle class, and to make America respected around the world again. And to unite us here at home. It's the honor of my lifetime that so many millions of Americans have voted for that vision. And now the work of making that vision is real. It's a task, the task of our time. Folks, as I said many times before, I'm Jill's husband. And I would not be here without her love and tireless support of Jill and my son, Hunter, and Ashley, my daughter, and all our grandchildren, and their spouses, and all our family. They're my heart. Jill's a mom, a military mom, an educator. And she has dedicated her life to education. But teaching isn't just what she does, it's who she is. For American educators, this is a great day for y'all. You're going to have one of your own in the White House. And Jill's going to make a great first lady. I'm so proud of her. And I'll have the honor of serving with the fantastic vice president who you just heard from, Kamala Harris, who makes history as the first woman, first black woman, the first woman from South Asia descent, the first daughter of an immigrant ever elected in this country. Don't tell me it's not possible in the United States. It's long overdue. And we're reminded tonight of those who fought so hard for so many years to make this happen. But once again, America's bent the arc of the moral universe more toward justice. Kamala, Doug, like it or not, your family, you become an honorary Biden, there's no way out. To all those of you who volunteered and worked the polls in the middle of this pandemic, local elected officials, you deserve a special thanks from the entire nation. And to my campaign team and all the volunteers and all who gave so much of themselves to make this moment possible, I owe you, I owe you, I owe you everything. And to all those who supported us, I'm proud of the campaign we built and ran. I'm proud of the coalition we put together, the broadest and most diverse coalition in history. Democrats, Republicans, independents, progressives, moderates, conservatives, young, old, urban, suburban, rural, gay, straight, transgender, white, Latino, Asian, Native American. I mean it, especially those moments, and especially those moments when this campaign was at its lowest ebb. The African American community stood up again for me. You always have my back, and I'll have yours. I said at the outset, I wanted to represent this campaign to represent and look like America. We've done that. Now that's what I want the administration to look like and act like. For all those of you who voted for President Trump, I understand the disappointment tonight. I've lost a couple times myself. But now, let's give each other a chance. It's time to put away the harsh rhetoric, lower the temperature, see each other again, listen to each other again. And to make progress, we have to stop treating our opponents as our enemies. They are not our enemies. They are Americans. They are Americans. The Bible tells us to everything there is a season, a time to build, a time to reap, and a time to sow, and a time to heal. This is the time to heal in America. Now this campaign is over, what is the will of the people? What is our mandate? I believe it's this. Americans have called upon us 
to marshal the forces of decency, the forces of fairness, to marshal the forces of science, and the forces of hope in the great battles of our time, the battle to control the virus, the battle to build prosperity, the battle to secure your family's health care, the battle to achieve racial justice and root out systemic racism in this country. And the battle to save our planet by getting climate under control. The battle to restore decency, defend democracy, and give everybody in this country a fair shot. That's all they're asking for, a fair shot. Folks, our work begins with getting COVID under control. We cannot repair the economy, restore our vitality, or relish life's most precious moments, hugging our grandchildren, our children, our birthdays, weddings, graduations, all the moments that matter most to us until we get it under control. On Monday, I will name a group of leading scientists and experts as transition advisors to help take the Biden-Harris COVID plan and convert it into an action blueprint that will start on January the 20th, 2021. That plan will be built on bedrock science. It will be constructed out of compassion, empathy, and concern. I will spare no effort, none, or any commitment to turn around this pandemic. Folks, I'm a proud Democrat, but I will govern as an American president. I'll work as hard for those who didn't vote for me as those who did. Let this grim era of demonization in America begin to end here and now. The refusal of Democrats and Republicans to cooperate with one another. It's not some mysterious force beyond our control. It's a decision, a choice we make. And if we can decide not to cooperate, then we can decide to cooperate. And I believe that this is part of the mandate given to us from the American people. They want us to cooperate in their interest. And that's the choice I'll make. And I'll call on Congress, Democrats and Republicans alike, to make that choice with me. The American story is about slow yet steadily widening the opportunities in America. And make no mistake, too many dreams have been deferred for too long. We must make the promises of the country real for everybody, no matter their race, their ethnicity, their faith, their identity, or their disability. Folks, America has always been shaped by inflection points, by moments in time where we've made hard decisions about who we are and what we want to be. Lincoln, in 1860, coming to save the Union. FDR in 1932, promising a beleaguered country a new deal. JFK in 1960, pledging a new frontier. And 12 years ago, when Barack Obama made history, he told us, yes, we can. Well, folks, we stand at an inflection point. We have an opportunity to defeat despair to build a nation of prosperity and purpose. We can do it, I know we can. I've long talked about the battle for the soul of America. We must restore the soul of America. Our nation is shaped by the constant battle between our better angels and our darkest impulses. And what presidents say in this battle matters. It's time for our better angels to prevail. Tonight, the whole world is watching America. And I believe at our best, America is a beacon for the globe. We will not lead, we will lead not only by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. I've always 
believed, many of you heard me say it, I've always believed we could define America in one word, possibilities. That, in America, everyone should be given an opportunity to go as far as their dreams and God-given ability will take them. You see, I believe in the possibilities of this country. We're always looking ahead, ahead to an America that's freer and more just, ahead to an America that creates jobs with dignity and respect, ahead of America that cures diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's, ahead to an America that never leaves anyone behind, ahead of America that never gives up, never gives in. This is a great nation. It's always been a bad bet to bet against America. We're good people. This is the United States of America. And there's never been anything, never been anything we've been able, not able to do when we've done it together. Folks, in the last days of the campaign, I began thinking about a hymn that means a lot to me and my family, particularly my deceased son, Bo. It captures the faith that sustains me which I believe sustains America. And I hope, and I hope it can provide some comfort and solace to the 230 million, thousand Americans who've lost a loved one through this terrible virus this year. My heart goes out to each and every one of you. Hopefully this hymn gives you solace as well. It goes like this. And he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, and make you to shine like the sun and hold you in the palm of his hand. And now together, on eagle's wings, we embark on the work that God and history have called upon us to do. With full hearts and steady hands, with faith in America and in each other, with love of country, a thirst for justice, let us be the nation that we know we can be, a nation united, a nation strengthened, a nation healed, the United States of America, ladies and gentlemen, there's never, never been anything we've tried we've not been able to do. So remember, as my grandpa, our grandpa used to say when I walked out of his home when I was a kid up in Scranton, he said, Joey, keep the faith. And our grandmother, when she was alive, she yelled, no, Joey, spread it. Spread the faith. God love you all. May God bless America, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you.